Welcome everybody. We'll just give folks a minute to join us. All right, I think we will go ahead and get started. Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm Jennifer Manukin, and I have the good luck of being Dean here at UCLA School of Law. And I wanna thank you for joining us today for this conversation. Before we be begin, I wanna acknowledge that UCLA School of Law sits on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. As members of a land grant institution, we at UCLA pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives past, present, and emerging. I want to extend a warm welcome to all of you to this latest installment of our From the Front Lines virtual series. In these uncommonly challenging times, uh, I feel lucky that here at UCLA, we, we have faculty, alums, and friends who are truly among the foremost experts in so many of the legal, social, and political issues that are at the heart of today's conversations. For today's conversation, Ending AAPI Hate, a discussion of the history and renewed surge of anti-Asian American and Pacific Islander violence in the United States. We're also tremendously grateful to have UCLA's Asian American Studies program as co-sponsors. I think it won't be a surprise to anybody listening in uh, today uh, that during the course of the coronavirus pandemic, uh, the number of reported anti-AAPI hate crimes across this country has risen dramatically. In recent months, this troubling trend has become even more apparent, uh, including the mass shooting in Atlanta, in which six women of Asian descent were murdered. The increase in anti-AAPI hate crimes and the public spotlight on anti-Asian hate has resulted in uh, a variety of, of efforts to, to counteract what's going on, ranging from community-based solutions to the passage of a bill in the Senate uh, intended to address this recent rise in violence. This month, as we celebrate Asian American and Pacific Islander heritage, I'm especially honored to welcome this tremendously distinguished panel of experts to help us understand the history of discrimination against Asian American and Pacific Islander communities, both historically and in this current moment, and to begin to talk about how we can find lasting solutions to address this longstanding problem that's gotten additional focus recently. Uh, so let me introduce our panelists briefly. It's really a terrific group, and I want to thank each of them for being willing to join us today. Uh, first, I'm pleased to welcome Stuart Kwa. Stuart is the President Emeritus, Founder, Past President, and Executive Director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice, Los Angeles. Stuart's a nationally recognized leader and a wise expert around a great many issues um, involving uh, Asian Americans, um, but also involving nonprofit organizations, philanthropies, civil rights more broadly, and legal services. He's had a tremendously distinguished career and has received more awards than I can possibly list today, including the prestigious MacArthur Genius Grant. I'm proud that Stuart is also a graduate of the UCLA School of Law and that I count him as a trusted member of the school's board of advisors. So thank you so much for joining us today, Stuart. Thank you, Jennifer. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, State Senator Dave Min. Dave represents the 37th District in the California State Senate, which includes Anaheim, Costa Mesa, Huntington Beach, Irvine, and Newport Beach. Prior to his service in the Senate, Dave taught business law as a faculty member at, as a professor at UC Irvine Law School, and he's a leading expert on banking and housing policy. Since being elected in 2020, Dave has been an active member of the California Asian and Pacific Islander Legislative Caucus, and he recently authored a resolution condemning the surge in anti-Asian violence. Thank you, Dave, so much for being willing to spend time with us today. I guess I should say Sen Sen Senator Min, welcome. That's fine. Thank you, Dean Mnookin, and thank you, UCLA Law, for, for hosting this very important panel. Uh, terrific. It's great to have you. I'm also delighted to welcome my colleague here at UCLA Law, Professor Hiroshi Motomura. Uh, Hiroshi joined UCLA Law School in 2007, and he currently serves as the Susan Westerberg Prager Distinguished Professor of Law and the faculty co-director of our Center for Immigration Law and Policy. Hiroshi is one of the nation's premier experts on immigration and citizenship, 
and he recently testified in a hearing in front of the U.S. House Judiciary Subcommittee, uh, the, the first hearing maybe ever, certainly in a very long time, focused specifically on discrimination and violence against Asian Americans. Hiroshi's scholarship and teaching have won him multiple honors and awards, including a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2018. So welcome, Hiroshi. Glad to be here. Thank you. Last but certainly not at all least, we're joined by Professor Karen Umamoto. It's terrific to have you here. Uh, Karen is a professor of urban planning here at UCLA and serves as the inaugural Helen and Morgan Chu Endowed Directors Chair of the Asian American Studies Center. Karen's research and teaching centers around planning in the context of social inclusion, participatory democracy, and political transformation. She's also an extremely well-regarded and prolific scholar. She's published more than 50 articles, books, and professional reports. Karen, I'm thrilled that you could be with us here today, and we're delighted that the Asian American Studies Program is a co-sponsor also of today's event. Welcome. Thank you. Honored to be here. Uh, Terrific. Um, so we, we have to make a decision here about whether we're going to be on all first name basis or go with uh, or, or go go with with official titles. Uh, Professor Motomura, which would you like? Do you want to be Hiroshi or Professor Motomura? Take your pick. I'm Hiroshi. Okay. Well then, I'm going to start with you, Hiroshi. <laughs> all right. uh, uh, there's there's certainly been growing awareness and visibility about violence against AAPI communities, um, and there's been a lot in the news about this. Um, but it's not a new problem. And I guess I'd love to have you get us started by helping us understand uh, with a legal lens, a, a little bit about the history of discrimination targeted at the AAPI communities. Can we begin now? Yeah. yeah, I mean, this of course is a good foundational question and you know, I'll, I'll try my best to answer it in an overview. Although of course, I mean, everyone else on this panel is as capable or more capable of answering this question as I am. But you know, one way to think about this is that um, I, I divide this, when you think about discrimination into government action and, and private action, although I think these are actually quite related, but at least for the purposes of an overview, it's worth, worth, thinking, it's worth thinking about government action and private action. You know, and so there are a lot of laws that uh, I think would be fairly described as discriminatory in the past in targeting uh, the Asian American community or Asian immigrants. And some of these are immigration laws, the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882, which is the law of the land till 1943 is one, but there's also an immigration system that uh, works to exclude, exclude Asian immigrants really until about 1965. And so that's one big bucket is immigration laws that have been discriminatory. And then, then there are a lot of citizenship laws that I would regard as discriminatory. Um, you know, the first naturalization statute allowing people to become U.S. citizens dates back to 1790. I mean, it, it was limited naturalization to free white persons. Um, and it was opened up to, this eligibility was opened up to African Americans um, uh, in 1870, but racial restrictions on naturalization to become a U.S. citizen were not completely repealed until 1952. So that's not that long ago. Um, and so these are, and then there are laws that are based on immigration citizenship laws, like restricting land ownership. Uh, we've had many of those laws. And then there's another kind of government action, which of course, uh, one example of which um, infamous, infamous example is the, is the incarceration of 120,000 Japanese Americans during World War II, most of whom um, were US citizens. Um, so, that's on the government side. There's more to be said about each of these, but that's just kind of on the government side as an overview. Um, long history of government um, instigation or, or um, doing things that are uh, expressly discriminatory. And then another way to understand discrimination is to focus on past episodes of violence against Asian uh, immigrant communities. Um, you know, this goes back quite a bit into the 1800s. I mean, we actually have a law, California uh, law in 1854 in a California Supreme Court case called People versus Hall that ruled that people of Asian descent could not testify against the white person in court, uh, which, which um, uh, had a lot to do with immunizing uh, anti-Asian violence uh, from uh, court action. But we have a number of incidents, including one in Los Angeles in 1871 uh, in um, targeting uh, uh, LA's small Chinese a community where um, you had lynchings that that, that took place, in, 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 uh, and the, this is this is there there are a number of incidents like this. But I also would be remiss if I didn't fast forward to a couple of incidents uh, in the last part of the 20th century. Um, you know, the targeting of Vietnamese. Uh, 
uh, fishermen who had been been given refugee status in the United States and 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 um, target targeting by uh, among others uh, the Ku Klux Klan in Texas at the time. There's the murder of Vincent Chin in 1982. Um, as in some sense a retaliation for uh, for the perception the Japanese were taking auto industry jobs. So there are more examples of this. And I'm sure my you know, co-panelists can contribute more, but I just want to emphasize that some of this is a government is, is directly government action. And some of it is private action that um, I, th I think in many ways is related to the government uh, foundation. Thank you. Thank you for that overview and, um, you know, for just giving us some of the contextualizing some of the, the lengthy history of both formal and informal uh, forms of discrimination. Uh, I, I think, Karen, let me turn to you next. Um, you've talked about this current moment um, as a potential opportunity for both greater solidarity within the Asian American community and also across different communities of color here in America. Um, can, can you, before we get to that part of the conversation, I'd love to ask you to, sit, to situate the current moment a little bit. Um, what, what, do you, what would you draw on? What social factors over the past few years and this past year have catalyzed the, the uptick in violence? Um, maybe you can get us started. And then if other panelists want to jump in on their ideas about, about causes, that would be great. Thank you. Thanks for that question, because I think a lot of people feel confused about what, why is this happening now? Um, and, and why is it happening in the way, why is it manifesting in the way that we're seeing it? So um, I used as my Zoom background, you know, Smokey the Bear's fire triangle, like one of the things that start a fire. So I use this as a metaphor, this metaphor of kind of a firestorm of hate. Um, and I start with fuel, right? I think it's really interesting to understand what are the layers of things that have um, con that constitute kind of this underbrush that have kind of lit fire uh, recently. So, you know, we have the pandemic. It's caused so much pain and agony. We have family in crisis, economic crisis and fear. We have the jingoistic trade war with China that's kind of primed the, the nation to to have a certain attitude towards Chinese and Asia. Uh, we have a weak mental health system, public health system, proliferation of uh, deadly weapons, and this whole misperception of Asians as the model minority who really don't suffer in the same way. So those are some of the things that, that, that um, kind of um, have led, laid the foundation for this. And then we have uh, the use of the term Chinese virus, right? That was kind of like the ignition switch uh, and there's empirical evidence that shows um, the kind of the kind of chatter in the Twitter sphere before and after the use of that term, and how uh, there was such a big rise in anti-Asian sentiment within social media uh, after the utterance of the term Chinese virus. Um, and then you had these kind of winds, right? The oxygen that fueled the spread of um, anti-Asian hate um, through social media and particularly through the actions of some of the supremacist oriented organizations um, that really spread, spread uh, this idea that Asians were to blame for the virus and Asians were to blame for the precarity that we many families have found themselves in. So I think, um, I think the metaphor could also be used to try to understand better the um, what solutions, right, there might be, and we could talk about that later, but how do you clear the underbrush? How do you turn down the heat? How do you um, kind of blow some countervailing winds to, to address this situation? Because it's not gonna go away tomorrow, right? Uh, during the anti-Muslim attacks following 9-11 and anti-Muslim attacks taking place uh, over the next couple of years. So I think it's, we have to get ready for this kind of thing for the long haul, longer haul. Thank you. I mean, that's, you know, it's it's uh, disconcerting to, to recognize that it's a long haul problem, but it's also critical to recognize that if we're gonna to try to figure out how to engage and come up with solutions. Would any of the other panelists like to weigh in about uh, kind of cause or what got us here? Yes, Sen Senator Min. I would just echo what uh, Professor Umamoto said. I, I've been using the same metaphor uh, on the campaign trail. I don't have your academic uh, credentials in this area, but 
I, I mean, clearly, as Hiroshi described, we have had a long history of anti-Asian racism in this country. Uh, I think, you know, from my vantage point, I think the the model minority has created resentment from other minority groups against Asian Americans. <clears throat> but that was kind of lingering in the background in a way that I think most APIs did not recognize the, the ubiquity and depth of some of this resentment until they, the racists were given license. And, and that scapegoating of Asian Americans for the coronavirus became like the match. And I've been using that analogy as well. It, it was really the spark that, that lit this off because how did you take that resentment and turn it into actual public actions where honestly, it feels like a lot of the racists uh, are, uh, just feel like they represent the majoritarian view, that they represent the views of the community. And, and I think that is creating like a, a vicious cycle where more and more of them see this and they feel like this is actually socially acceptable to go target and bully Asian Americans. And, and I think that's what we're seeing across the state and across the country. So a blend of something new and also the uh, a growing group, a, a larger group of people's willingness to either act upon or be more explicit in relationship to undercurrents that were already there. Is that what I'm? Is that what I'm hearing? Is that? From my perspective, yeah, and we're seeing this accelerate. You know, stop API hate, track reports of um, hate incidents. Uh, just I think in the last couple of months reported the same number of API incidents as over the previous nine months since March 2020. Uh, so it seems like there is, and anecdotally, social media and uh, you know, otherwise, it does seem like we're getting reports uh, of, of uh, all sorts of attacks on Asian Americans. Right, right. Thank you. Um, Stuart, let me turn to you for a question. Um, you know, we're, we're at this moment of heightened awareness around hate crimes, um, but it's not a new phenomenon. That's clear, and we've been talking about that. You founded Asians Americans Advancing Justice back in, I think, 1983 or so, um, in part to address some of these kinds of issues. I mean, partly, not only, um, but but these issues are still with us. I, I'd, be, I'd love to hear your analysis on what's changed, uh, what remains the same, um, and how you think about the, the, the shifting frames around these very important uh, uh, issues over the last gosh, um, 30, almost 40 years. Well, um, thank you, Jennifer, and thank you to the UCLA Law School for uh, hosting this, as well as the Asian American Study Center. Um, let me just start off with a personal note. I was the only uh, out-of-state co-counsel to the mother of Vincent Chin. So I've been at this for a long time. Uh, since 1983. I remember uh, Mrs. Chen came out to Los Angeles to plead uh, for help to get justice for her son. And I remember uh, I was moderating a, a discussion in Chinatown in 1984, where Mrs. Chen came out to Los Angeles. And at one point she fainted and I uh, helped her to her feet that night. She was staying at my home and I asked her, uh, Lily, are you okay? And she said, you know, Stuart, there's nothing I can do to bring back Vincent, but I don't want any other mother to go through what I've gone through. And so I've had this personal relationship for uh, 40 some odd years. Um, in addition, um, as Hiroshi said, there were a number of massacres of uh, Chinese workers in the uh, la latter part of the uh, 1800s. And my uh, great grandfather was a miner uh, in New Mexico and in the West. And uh, because uh, Chinese couldn't bring over families, um, on one occasion, he disappeared. And every so often an archeologist finds um, a bunch of bones at a ravine in the West and they studied them and they said uh, they were probably Chinese miners who were uh, shot and killed uh, in moments of hate. And I, I often think my great, great grandfather was amongst those. Uh, so I have a personal relationship um, to this, uh, to the wave of violence now. I think that 
what's different this time, and I could talk about uh, the op-ed piece I wrote on April 27th, I co-wrote in the LA Times a little later in terms of uh, prevention, uh, you know, how do you stop the violence? But I think what's different this time is that number one, uh, the violence is very, is across the country. It's not like in Detroit, Michigan, uh, where Vincent was uh, killed. And uh, because of the auto workers uh, thinking that Japanese were causing unemployment in the auto industry in the US. Uh, but even though I worked on that from Los Angeles uh, to Detroit, it, it was mainly seen as a Midwest issue uh, amongst the general public, although for Asian Americans, it hit to our hearts. Uh, the other thing is this, it, it is, um, the attacks are multi-ethnic. In other words, um, uh, Ch it's not just Chinese because of the China virus, uh, Chinese, uh, Koreans, Vietnamese, uh, South, other Southeast Asians, South Asians, Pacific Islanders, uh, a broad swath of Asian Americans are being caught up in this and have been victims of violence. I think the other uh, dimension that I can explore a uh, little later is that this is a moment where Blacks and Latinos uh, and Native Americans all feel that they're treated as the other in American society. Um, it may be slightly different in the sense that uh, Blacks feel um, law enforcement is oftentimes singling them out and uh, especially brutal. Um, Latinos with the um, migrants at the border and uh, other issues and uh, also for Native Americans. So this is a moment, uh, I think it's a big challenge for our multiracial democracy because it's coming at a perilous moment where very uh, many people of color feel as though they're the other in American society and they're not accepted as Americans. And so um, I think the, the future of our society is really at stake at this moment in time. So it's a very crucial moment. Indeed, uh, crucial and, um, and perilous. I mean, as you described, uh, you know, there's a lot of, of, you know, conceptual challenges in how we think about um, embracing a multicultural democracy and making it function. Um, I guess uh, that, that takes me back to you, Senator Min, um, to, to, to ask about legislation as one space of engagement um, around, uh, around this. Um, I, I know that the, the California Asian and Pacific Islander Legislative Caucus announced one of its priorities in 2021 is to address uh, anti-Asian hate crimes and discrimination. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the legislation that you think um, that, that is either planned, um, but also maybe about the kind of coalitional questions that Stuart's comment um, invites well, engagement with. Yeah, and, and just to tack on to what Stuart and Karen were saying, um, I think that you know what is shocking about this moment is just the sheer ubiquity of anti-Asian hate in all forms. <clears throat> you see people just feel like they can take license and you know, in the, in the most benign of cases, just invade the personal space and autonomy of Asian Americans, typically women and the elderly. Um, harassment, stalking, you know, maybe spitting on them. Um, you know, and in the worst cases, of course, we see, you know, physical assault and, and, and sometimes murder, but it is happening around the country and it's, it's, it's really a national phenomenon that's uh, quite frightening. Uh, I guess the way I look at this is we've got a a long-term issue to address. And you know, some of the bills that we're proposing try to address some of these different issues. Um, the API Legislative Caucus, I should say, has a list of, uh, I think, 12 to 13 bills that we are formally supporting. There are about two dozen bills right now working their way through both houses of the California State Legislature <clears throat> to try to address anti-Asian hate or hate in various forms. Um, 
some of these look to things like data, um, to education, uh, ethnic studies, education, demographic data collection. Uh, and that's obviously more of a long-term approach, but this is a long run problem. Uh, you know, fighting anti-Asian racism is not gonna happen overnight. Uh, but I see the short-term problem being that people feel right now like they can target Asian Americans with no repercussions, that, that they again represent the majoritarian viewpoints when they do that. And how do you combat that? Um, we, we've got some different laws that are working their way through. I think a lot of these will get passed, uh, primarily focusing on uh, police reporting and responses to anti-Asian hate. Uh, we've got um, a, a bill by Al Murtsuchi that would require a, a creation of a toll-free hotline number for hate crimes and discriminatory incidents. Uh, we've got um, a number of different uh, law enforcement training and, and response, including one I've authored, co-authored AB 57, um, you know, and some people do view this as a law enforcement problem, but, you know, I ultimately think that legislation and law enforcement are going to have a, a limited utility in fighting the, the rise of anti-Asian hate incidents that we're seeing right now. Um, I do think ultimately what we need to do is, is to make people realize that this is not acceptable, that, that anti-Asian hate and, and vocally or physically expressing that is unacceptable, that they will be condemned, that they will suffer, suffer that social isolation that happens. Uh, and I think that just requires coalition building very quickly right now across the board. And uh, it's one of the reasons my office and I have been, you know, doing so many of these anti-Asian uh, hate uh, rallies and events, because I, I think it's, it's critical that, that we build up that support, that we we get our allies out there, black, brown in particular, but also white, Jewish, Arab, uh, to, to stand with us right now uh, and make sure that, that every community out there standing strong against anti-Asian hate. Uh, because I, I do feel like there is a license, there's open season right now uh, on Asian Americans. And, and I, I would just kind of, the last point I'd make is, is, you know, I think Karen was touching upon the idea that this is a critical moment for building those coalitions. And I, I agree with that 100%. Uh, we, as Asian Americans, I think, can do a better job. We have to remember after hopefully this, this moment passes that we need to also stand with our black and brown uh, and other marginalized communities uh, when they are being targeted. But it's also a moment of incredible danger because you know there are a number of active right-wing Asian groups that are deliberately stoking racial fears right now. Uh, every time there is a black on Asian or Latino on a Asian, that incident is going viral on right-wing channels, on WeChat, on, uh, in, in Chinese media and other Asian language media, in social media. And they are painting this as a, a, a issue of law enforcement, an issue of racial tension that is natural. Uh, I got asked the question the other day at a, an Asian event but by a right-wing Asian, uh, do you think that Black Lives Matter caused this particular rise in anti-Asian hate by causing law enforcement to be defunded? So, i.e. Black Lives Matter led to defund the police, led to people not being able to attack Asians. And, and I couldn't believe I got asked that question, but, but that's the type of reasoning that's happening uh, outside the halls of academia, outside the halls of government, uh, but in a lot of these places where, you know, we, we saw the same forces work and in, in the Prop 16 battles last year, uh, you know, we're, we're a different narrative. And, and that's one that's also dangerous as far as the API communities, uh, that, that this could stoke more racial tensions within Asian com communities and those that have been victimized. Anybody else wanna jump in about this? I mean, cause these are, that's a really thoughtful and, and, and complicated uh, description of some of the challenges of, of, of allyship and intersectionality and cross currents. Uh, Karen, do you want to jump in on that? You're, you're, you look like you might. I don't want to put you on the spot. No, no, no. Um, just two, two points. Um, my colleagues uh, at the Institute of American Cultures at UCLA and I are analyzing 17 years of hate crime data in LA County and um, looking at, uh, I, and I really uh, want to underscore um, Senator Min's point about the fact that um, there is a concern about Asians believing that the main perpetrators of anti-Asian hate are African-Americans because of those viral videos. And 
if you look at the statistics, the, the actual co racial composition of those who have committed hate crimes against Asian Americans pretty much reflects the population of the county. So it's not that you know, African Americans are the main perpetrator. In fact, they're the minority uh, when you look, actually look at the data. Um, the other is that you know, part of this, um, the racial hierarchy where we find ourselves in you know, kind of Asian Americans put kind of in the middle of that racial hierarchy, then gets, um, you, you get squeezed in the middle and you, you get uh, kind of anger from both sides with that perception of the, with the model minority and the perpetual foreigner. So I think that instead of necessarily um, being so defensive about that position, I think we need to do more education about how racial hierarchy, right? How structures of racism, how that racial hierarchy works to all of our disadvantage, um, and how what it, what would it take for us to really have a society where we have much better race relations, much more equity, much more uh, a fuller democracy and democratic force and greater respect across all color lines and their social boundaries um, that we experience in the United States. Stuart, yes. Yeah, Jennifer, I think it was uh, probably a follow-up question. Uh, I co-wrote an op-ed piece for yes. the LA Times on April 27th. And I, uh, in answer to some of the questions on the chat room today too, I posed um, several options of what people could do. Uh, but basically, uh, you know, we've been tracking hate crimes for 40 years. Uh, we, we do believe that hate crimes should be enforced, but uh, that's after the fact. It's uh, somebody has already been killed or somebody has already been injured. Um, so how do we actually prevent the hate crimes from occurring in the first place. Uh, I, I mentioned three things. One is I think programmatically we should look at uh, programs like bystander intervention training, uh, mental health programs, housing programs, but uh, Asian Americans Advancing Justice LA has been uh, following some of our other affiliates in holding uh, bystander intervention trainings not only for Asians, but for non-Asians as well. And they've been fully subscribed. I mean, 500 people uh, or more uh, who have come on to these trainings. We, we planned three, but now we're planning uh, several others. Uh, so that's one uh, level. I think um, we already have a, a hotline that is national in six Asian languages. Uh, we have uh, organized some pro bono attorneys um, in case there are some uh, cases or some uh, tensions that need addressing legally. The second thing I uh, mentioned in the article is the need for uh, deeper multiracial uh, unity. Uh, as Dave said, you know, Asians cannot just say, oh, we're being attacked, help us. Uh, we have to also uh, reach out uh, at this moment in time to not only express, but stand in solidarity with our uh, Black and Latino brothers and sisters and uh, really make sure that people understand that we're in the social justice, racial justice um, arena for the long term. Uh, not just short term, because it's in our interest to stop the attacks. And the last thing I just wanted to point out is that even in Los Angeles, in the public schools, K through 12, there's no Asian American studies. There is no Asian American ethnic studies, uh, believe it or not, in the county with the largest Asian population in the United States, uh, countywide. Uh, we don't have uh, any ethnic studies. It's buried in a survey course uh, with a bunch of questions, but there's no uh, lesson plans. 
So my wife and I, um, as I uh, handled post uh, being executive director at Asian Americans Advancing Justice, we started a group still uh, sponsored by Asian Americans Advancing Justice, but a group called Asian American Education Project. You could look at our website, asianamericanedu.org. And we, uh, we're also working with Karen because uh, the LAUSD doesn't have uh, our lesson plans. Uh, they don't have Asian American ethnic studies. I just think uh, we are invisible uh, for the broad swath of students, even in the LA Unified School System. So we're trying to change that. Our goal over several years is to get a million American youth to learn about our history, struggles, and contributions. We think that would be a start to counteract the uh, long-term ignorance about Asian Americans. I, it's, you know, what Hiroshi started off saying, you know, those of us who are activists have heard those stories over and over again, but believe it or not, the vast majority of students in the LA Unified School System and indeed throughout the state of California don't know hardly any of those stories. They don't know hardly any of those names. They're not heroes to them. Uh, they're, they're invisible. So we have to change that as well. Right, so, so lifting up these experiences, backgrounds and stories as part of, uh, part, part of what, what everybody's learning um, could be a, a really a, a valuable um, next step. And thank you, Stuart, you did beat me to it. I was going to ask you about your op-ed. Um, I, uh, I, I think it's also in the chat for those who would like to connect to, to click on it. It's, it's very much worth, worth reading. Um, I wanna circle back to you, Hiroshi, and then um, I'll, I'll start going back and forth between some of the chat questions and some of the, uh, the other questions that you want. Um, uh, some of what our audience has been asking about to join the conversation as well. But before I do that, Hiroshi, I do wanna take this back to, to, to immigration. Um, much of your scholarship is centered around immigration. And I'd love to have you share with us a little bit more about um, some of the violence and discrimination we've both seen in recent months. And it's also part of the broader historical story uh, uh, around Asian Americans uh, and America's immigration system. Um, I know there are potential links because I've heard you talk about them. I'd love to, to hear a little bit about that here. Yeah, no, thanks for the question. And it's it's also, um, I mean, to transition into, into answering it, I just want to lift up some of the things I just heard from my co-panelists because um, there have been, you know, interesting narratives, counter narratives um, and sort of um, that we've heard a little bit about. I think Dave mentioned them. I mean, that, that you know, there's a, a story that this, that a lot of um, the violence that we've seen is attributable in some way to police defunding, which is then, you know, supposedly attributable to Black Lives Matter. Um, and, and so as I re reflect back on the the, the, the House subcommittee hearing I testified at, there, there are a couple of different counter narratives that have been mentioned here that are, that are really kind of mainstream narratives in some sense. I mean, one is that this is a, this is a problem that's attributed, that violence is a problem attributable to, to police defunding. And, and another one, um, which is a much more simple counter narrative is that these are isolated incidents uh, for which certain people could be blamed, uh, the individual perpetrators, but it's really not in, in, in some sense kind of something that should be understood in societal terms. And those are the counter narratives. Um, so your question about immigration, I think is, is, a, is very foundational to understanding what I think is really going on here. Um, you know, these, these incidents uh, with, uh, of various degrees of seriousness, but I think they all come from a place that's based on a, a foundation for which I think um, the immigration and citizenship laws that I mentioned earlier are very much, you know, part of the story. Um, you know, I mentioned that um, that the restrictions on Asian immigrants uh, in terms of um, coming to the United States, but also to citizenship, have been pervasive and really long-standing. But let me just take a step back and and and, and say something about immigration laws that. Uh, We'll circle back a little bit to I think what some of the points that Stuart made. Um, you know, we think about immigration laws at the very simplest as, as being the border, right? I mean, there are people on the outside and there are people on the inside. And what immigration laws do is create legal barriers. 
And so it's kind of an idea, well, this is the wall. Um, but you know, that's, that's not really not the way immigration law works. Um, that, um, I mean, what immigration laws do is they allow some communities to build and flourish and some people to petition for their spouses and, and other relatives to come to this country and, and other, and other uh, communities uh, are, 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 some communities are allowed to, to flourish and build and some are not. And so one of the ways to understand um, the, 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 the negative consequences of immigration law is, is that when you tell people uh, who are in the United States, um, Stuart alluded to this a bit earlier, when you tell people in the United States that they can't bring their families over, uh, well, that, 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 that they, they can't um, uh, really build that community, then you're really, you're really devaluing them. And so this is the phenomenon that we see. And so this is, I think, the legal foundation of of really being regarded immigrant groups as being regarded as foreigners, which then feeds the narrative, which makes it um, very much, as, as Dave said, kind of a long-term problem. Now, I, 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 the reason this goes back to something that, that Stuart said is that you know he's, he's talking. I think actually we all have about so coalition building, and um, I think that we've seen this not just uh, in the Asian American community in this past generation. I mean, certainly. Uh, the fact that you know we had a ban on on, on, on significant Muslim immigration uh, to the United States um, is the same kind of devaluing of what it means to be a U.S. citizen uh, from the affected countries, whether it be in the, the case of the uh, Muslim ban or um, a ban on, on 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 African immigration. And so, and I think that a lot of this uh, has been um, the what's happened with the Latino community of a system that. Um, makes it quite possible uh, in de facto terms to come to the United States to work, but without the recognition of legal status. And so I think that I think that that's a, actually a common experience of immigrant groups um, that have been marginalized. It's not just Asian Americans. And I think a lot of groups continue to be um, treated this way. And I think that's that's a weaponization of law, which, you know, as a as a as a as a law person, I mean, it's 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 deeply troubling that the rule of law has has, has has done this, um, and and so I think that's um, that's an important part of the foundation that I think, especially people associated with the law, but really all citizens should be very concerned about. Thank you. Um, I do. Any other panelists want to jump in there, or there was a lot there. Um, okay. Well, then I'm going to keep going. Or, Senator Min, was that a? Do, do uh, yeah, I was just going to follow up and say, uh, you know, I I. I totally appreciate Hiroshi's comments. And I think, you know, it's it's kind of amazing to me as I look back on this, and I'm not an immigration law person, that uh, it was almost a century after the 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 amendments were passed, ostensibly guaranteeing all people uh, rights and no discrimination based on race uh, before Asian Americans achieved like something like equal footing in this country. And many Asian Americans, like my parents, came in after the 65 changes ended the, the immigration law, ended the racial quota or the country of origin quotas. Um, you know, and that has effects as far as our own immigration patterns. And, you know, one thing I would just remark on is I, I'm only one of two Asian senators, API senators in the California State Senate out of 40. Um, it was one of the reasons I've had to become, you know, a, a someone who speaks on this issue that I did not campaign on. I, I don't have the breadth of knowledge of you all, uh, but because there's only two of us, you have to be the spokesperson. And, and I was, you know, the second Korean American ever elected to the state Senate. The first back in 1978, when he stepped down uh, was Alfred Song. And that was over 40 years ago. So we're talking about a huge gap and uh, there are just you know, representation problems. It's something that they, I know the API community has been dealing with is how do we get more representation in the boardrooms in in politics in you know, in the halls of academia, in the deanships, in all these places of power, uh, because that's also part of why we're starved of power in some ways. Right, that's right. So all of these spaces, I mean, law firm partnerships, I mean, there's lots of uh, uh, notwithstanding kind of the, the model minority rhetoric there are lots of um, hallways of power where there's underrepresentation, and that's that's relevant to the conversation too. And we've got a, a number of questions in the chat, a number of comments, and some of them are, are, are challenging um, and interesting ones. And I do uh, want this group to, to take some of them on. One of uh, uh, several several engage with the relationship between um, foreign policy and 
um, and and discrimination and cultural sentiment, right? So um, I'm, I'm wondering if any of you will comment on sort of how we think about you know U.S. China relationships or U.S. Uh, North Korea relationships and how that impacts or connects to uh, uh, people's conception of Asian American individuals and creates spaces that may um, make discrimination uh, flourish more than it might otherwise. And of course, we see this in other settings too, not just with uh, you know Asia US um, relations. I could speak. I think, yeah. Okay, sure. First, Karen, then Stuart. Sure. Um, yeah, I could speak real briefly to that and, and hand it over to Stuart. Um, you know, global geopolitics always plays an important role in how Asian Americans are treated because there's still not a full acceptance that Asians are part of the core fabric of American society and that we're trans, we're forever the perpetual form for our transplants to this country with um, suspicions as to where our loyalties lie. So, you know, the, the classic example is World War II and the incarceration of these Americans who were uh, told, uh, thought to be uh, possible collaborators with the enemy, with, with the enemy, even though there was no proof of that throughout that entire time. So, uh, the trade war now with China, there's a difference between economic competition, right? Because we compete with other countries all the time. Um, we meaning the you know, co corporate America with, with other corporations, but you know, it's a, it's a globalized uh, economy. And so it's, it's almost a, a falsity that there's um, a, a, some of that because of the um, internationalization, right? Of the sector. But I think there's a difference between that and jingoism. I think trade war jingoism that really pre presents China as the as cause of all of our economic woes and by uh, association Chinese Americans and by association Asian Americans as a source of, of economic precarity in the United States. Uh, is something that contributes to the current rise in anti-Asian sentiment. So, it, yeah, I think that's a good point that the um, that the participant raises that there's always a connection between global geopolitics and the treatment of Asian Americans and perception of Asian Americans uh, in the U.S. Thank you, Karen, for that analysis. Stuart, I'd love to, you to yeah, jump in too. That, I think that's the point. Is that because Asian Americans are not seen as Americans, uh, certainly not as full Americans, uh, and there, there's the, the stereotypes of being the so-called perpetual foreigner or the model minority uh, fill the picture when you have to uh, confront the reality. And I think that the reality that we're in right now is that the pandemic hopefully will subside, but the blaming of anybody who looks Chinese uh, will continue because in the eyes of uh, many in this government, China is the adversary, is the enemy. And, and I think about it uh, often I, th I was uh, to I'm totally against the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II, but think about it for a moment and think about what Japanese Americans would have faced because Japan was the enemy because they attacked us. In that case, what would have Japanese faced? What would they have faced in that period of time? Uh, I, th I believe that they should have still had their liberty and their dignity, uh, and, but they would have faced a lot of attacks. So I think that what uh, we have to be able to do is become stronger, uh, stronger politically, stronger in alliances, uh, especially with people of color, but all other Americans. Uh, this is, I think we have to dig in for the long haul rather than to look at it as a short-term blip of violence. 
So uh, Dave, you'll have to speak on this much more, but I think that we have to create levers where um, breaking that ign ignorance um, will take a period of time and we need short-term and long-term measures. Short-term like the bystander intervention training, long-term like the education, uh, but we're going to have to uh, really join in the fight for racial justice. Otherwise we will become increasingly victimized. Thank you for that. A couple of other um, things from the chat that I wanna sort of draw to our, our collective attention. A couple of people were uh, commenting on the fact that South Asians haven't been part of our conversation today. Um, and uh, and the, the framing about the current wave of violence may also um, not be as focused on, on, on South Asians as on uh, other Asian American groups. But I wondered if you had any comments on that or on sort of how we conceptualize uh, uh, categories, allyship, um, connections, and, and, and the complexities of, of that. You know, well, one thing, one thing I'll add to that is that I didn't give any specific ex examples um, that, that named um, South Asian immigrants, but, but they're very much part of the story I was telling. Um, you know, we have, we have, we have, we have um, uh, violent incidents of the kind that were directed against, uh, the, for example, the, the LA situation uh, against Chinese Americans, uh, against the Sikh community in Washington state. And so it goes back that far. Um, but but the but and and all the um, all of the um, immigration and citizenship laws that I mentioned uh, earlier, or many of them, I should say, and in particular the system that prevailed from um, the 1917 to 1965, um, targeted South Asians in the same in the same in the same way. Uh, you know, one of the um, the, the, the 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 well known cases regarding who qualifies as white for the purpose of becoming eligible for naturalization as US citizen uh, involved uh, a gentleman named Thind uh, from, from India. And, 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 and I also would, would add, um, if, we, if, we, if we're looking at um, sort of the ways in which laws um, have laid the foundation um, for um, everything from discrimination to, to hate and violence uh, against South Asian, um, you really have to think about um, uh, uh, some, some of the post 9-11 uh, measures you have to really um, and 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 all these things add up. So I, I didn't. Um, if, if I left that out of my accounting, it was only because I was giving you sort of this general um, version. But it's certainly true that um, that that we're talking about um, the inclusion of South Asian immigrants. And I'm very I'm really glad for the for the question for that reason. Thank and just you. To add that um, the Islamophobia after. 9-11-2001 uh, led to, we kept track of at least 500 hate crimes and hate incidents against South Asians across the United States. And of course, um, that was a wave of violence, but it's continued. And uh, for example, in 2012, there were six Sikhs who were uh, shot and killed in, um, in the Midwest. And then uh, just uh, th last month, um, another group of Sikhs were uh, shot and killed in Indianapolis. So I think the wave of violence has also affected South Asian very dramatically and very um, uh, dramatically in a very sad way. And so uh, I do uh, uh, agree fully that South Asians are part of uh, our coalition to fight against the uh, marginaliz marginalization of uh, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Thank you. Um, I'll share one other set of uh, comments from the chat and then I'm gonna have a concluding question for, for all of you. Um, uh, several people in the chat have uh, commented on the importance of cultural representation too. So uh, Senator Mins talked about, uh, you know, representation in the legislature, in boardrooms, in, in uh, you know, in academia, in partnerships. Uh, Stewart has talked about curriculum and the importance of, uh, 
of the narratives that are presented as part of our educational uh, process. But of course, there's also you know entertainment and Hollywood representation and the stories that get told there. And so several comments in the chat have engaged with that. Um, so in case any of you want to want to comment on that, you can. Um, but together with that, because we only have four minutes left, I want to invite you each to uh, to give us sort of a a, a closing suggestion. Um, if if you had the if you could advise uh, the, the relevant set of you know whether it's the legislature or or uh, those creating curricula or whatever whatever in, whatever institutional location um, has the potential power to make a change um, to do to do something next that hasn't happened yet um, to try to stem this rise of violence and discrimination. Um, uh, what would you what would you prioritize? What would you what would you suggest as a, a, a next thing to try to get some improvement? Um, Karen, why don't I start with you? Thank you. You know, we're an educational institution. UCLA is home to the largest concentration of ethnic studies faculty in the country, and we have 50 years of ethnic studies under our belt. But most of this knowledge is kind of hidden behind paywalls of published. Uh, of journals and, and, and libraries. So one of the things that we're trying to do is to um, initiate uh, an ethnic studies and Asian, starting with Asian American studies for us, because that's where our area of specialization lies, but to do a multimedia digital book for high school and college students under the banner or tagline of Asian American studies in every home. Um, there is a need for free, freely accessible, engaging, scholar-informed uh, curricula in Asian American studies um, that anyone anywhere with a computer connection, internet connection can get access to. And that's one of the things that we're going to be trying to do in the next uh, year or two um, to get that up and, and freely available. So we hope to, you know, work with collaboratively with the kind of national network of scholars um, and lend their expertise. So Hiroshi, I will be talking more to you about that. So thank you. Thank you, Karen. Senator Min, how about you? First of all, thank you for this panel. Um, really appreciate you putting it on and thanks for your engagement, Dean. Um, you know, I just want to build on that fire metaphor a little bit more because I, th I think it really describes what we're facing right now. In California, of course, we know that we're facing this year incredible conditions for wildfires. Uh, it's the driest year on record. Uh, we'll probably have a lot of these. The moment one of those starts blazing, priority one has to be to put out the fire, but priority two has to be to try to address the underlying conditions uh, so that we can reduce the risk of fire going forward. And so as far as the fire right now, again, legislation, we're, we're doing what we can, we'll take suggestions, but. Uh, I, I really think that forums like this, having leaders step up and publicly and loudly denounce anti-Asian hate, it sounds trite, but it's so important because we cannot allow this to feel like it's a mainstream sentiment. Uh, you know, the point right now is that it's not the police, it's not, it's not Black Lives Matter. What we're seeing is like random everyday people on the street feeling emboldened to go up to strangers who happen to look Asian and, and, and physically or verbally assaulting them. That's not normal and there's nothing police or the law can do about that. It has to be some kind of cultural condemnation that I think turns the tide in the short run. Uh, in the long run, I, I just wanna echo the suggestions that were made by everybody else. It's about intersectionality, coalition building, education. And by the way, I was on a panel with assembly member Evan Lowe the other day and we kind of verbally committed, we're gonna be continuing to push that ethnic studies curriculum to be a mandate, not just a model curriculum. And by the way, I come from Orange County where we have a lot of people who are very strongly opposed to ethnic studies. Uh, it's become almost as bad as critical race theory in their minds, um, as far as uh, quote unquote liberal boogeymen. But, but it's something that's so important because when you don't have any sense that these people who are in your spaces belong there, that they're part of your country's history, uh, it, it's both demoralizing for Asian Americans and, and other ethnic groups it's also uh, very problematic as far as the majoritarian perspective on, on what is and isn't part of America. And I think it feeds into that. Uh, we've got to be better allies, both within the Asian community to each other, with South Asians, Filipinos, uh, Southeast Asians, uh, Arab Americans, et cetera. Uh, and we have to um, 
do better with our other allies as well. We have to be there when stuff hits the fan in ways that Asian Americans are not always known for doing. Uh, we, we do the right things with groups like AAJ, with folks in Washington, D.C. and Sacramento. The problem is that our folks on the ground are not always seen as being present when other groups are facing strife. I'm muted. Thank you for that. We're just about out of time, but I want to, Stuart and Hiroshi, I want to give you each a chance for a, a um, quick last word about next steps. So Stuart, you're up. Um, yes, I think, um, I think our politicians have to stand against uh, demonizing China and uh, call for a balanced approach of competition and uh, cooperation uh, rather than just bashing China. And I think locally, we have to, we have 50 lesson plans. We need to get them into the schools as quickly and as urgently as possible, because that's our long-term guard against seeing Asians as the other and as foreigners or the uh, other stereotypes that we have. Thank you. Hiroshi, you get the last word. Okay, um, let me name three things to resist and th three things to think. Uh, I think it's important to resist uh, or to avoid deflection to other issues, which I think is happening here. I think it's, avoid, it's important to avoid the temptation to look for short-term fixes. This is a long-term phenomenon. And it's important to avoid the normalization of violence. Those are three things to resist or avoid. I also think it's important to think, think differently in, 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 in three ways. One is to think back more in time, where this came from. Another is, uh, this is especially for, for lawyers, but also for citizens, is to really question the role of law in this and to not normalize and accept um, things like some people don't belong here. And the third is to think more broadly. Um, uh, we've talked about coalition building among racial and ethnic and religious groups, but I also think it's important to think about this in terms of something that we haven't really talked about, which is the intersectional gender um, and, 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 some, and, and some of the, uh, which I think is part of what's going on in some of the violent incidents. And so those are three things to resist and three things to think more broadly about. Thank you for that. Thank you for the, giving us things to think about in closing. I wanna thank all of my distinguished panelists today for joining us. Um, for a really important and interesting conversation about this, uh, this critical issue. Uh, Senator Min, I wish you good luck with your legislation. Uh, uh, I, I hope that when we, we next um, gather to talk about these issues that there has been um, you know, some progress in the right direction. And thank you to the audience for joining us and for the, uh, for the terrific questions. Thanks for being with us virtually here at UCLA Law School. Take care everybody and have a good weekend. Thank you.